On Wednesday, September 30, 2009, at 516 in the afternoon, a magnitude 7.6 earthquake struck the west coast of Sumatra, Indonesia. The earthquake caused 20 seconds of severe ground shaking, resulted in widespread damage, and caused 1,200 deaths. The epicenter was located 60 kilometers offshore from Padang and about 80 kilometers beneath the ocean floor. The earthquake occurred deep beneath a subduction zone where one plate is being forced under another. Many of the deaths caused by the earthquake occurred in Lubuk Lawe, a rural mountain area northeast of Padang, where extensive landslides and mud flows buried more than 600 people and demolished at least five villages. Heavy rain over several days before the earthquake is likely to have saturated the ground, weakening the soil. The low-lying coastal regions of Padang and the surrounding west coast of Sumatra have one of the highest tsunami risks in the world. The Banda Aceh tsunami of 2004 reshaped the landscape and took more than 200,000 lives. In Banda Aceh, a lot of people didn't, didn't evacuate. They started picking up after the earthquake. Um, and by the time they realized that a tsunami was coming, it was too late. Um, it was only a segment of that fault that ruptured. Padang has almost four times the population than Banda Aceh. 400,000 people live in the coastal area, uh, probably inundated by tsunami. Um, and Padang city is so flat. Even though we already educated all people and they know how to evacuate immediately after second stop, not all people can reach a safe zone area in 30 minutes. Most of the major roads are running parallel to the coast. So it's very difficult for this amount of people to get inland to safe ground. The BMKG's extremely well-run seismic network determined the location and depth of the earthquake in just over a minute and determined that there was no risk from a tsunami due to the great depth of this earthquake. It was very difficult to tell the public that there was no tsunami, so people kept on evacuating. If there would have been a tsunami, it would have been extremely devastating for the city. Wherever you are, you first are exposed to an earthquake before the tsunami. So you have to look at the earthquake safety of, 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 of your infrastructure and your, and your buildings uh, before you even start thinking about the tsunami. A lot of the buildings that were damaged, well, they were all existing buildings, but many were built uh, prior to modern earthquake provisions. So I think in those cases, the, the buildings just didn't have adequate strength and stiffness. Many buildings collapsed, either partially or completely. These collapses were more common for concrete buildings constructed prior to 2002, when Indonesia revised its building codes. Concrete failure was caused by a number of factors, including the absence of column stirrups in joints, the use of smooth as opposed to deformed rebar, and concrete containing large, rounded river rocks. According to government reports, up to 140,000 homes were damaged in Padang and the surrounding areas. The causes of home collapses include weak mortar, poor bonding between bricks or stones, and the addition of second stories that introduced too much weight. If you add a story onto it, you have to think about the floors below. Are they really strong enough to support that story? Or if you add a wing to it, what kind of lateral loads the new building puts on the old building or vice versa. Timber houses performed well due to their lighter weight and proportionally higher strength. Approximately half of Padang's large multi-story hotels suffered significant damage during the quake. The collapsed Ambassand Hotel received extensive media coverage because of the large number of guests who were killed. This part of Padang has suffered uh, a lot of damage throughout the, uh, the blocks that are surrounding this. So it's pretty clear that this site got a very hard shake uh, and that perhaps the uh, soil conditions were, could, could possibly have been worse than uh, some other parts of, of Padang. Padang in Indonesia is like many developing countries that you tend to find very few steel buildings. And that's because steel is an imported material. And usually steel does well in earthquakes, uh, does better than say concrete or masonry. But in this case, we found that, that a number of the steel buildings, some of which were quite new, in fact, collapsed. A lot of the earthquake-resistant details and practice that we've developed in the U.S. and is in Japan, that wasn't evident in the structures that we saw. For example, some light-framed steel buildings were weighed down with very heavy concrete slabs and infill walls. The Padang earthquake caused over 1,200 deaths and significant damage to 140,000 homes, 
And yet, Sumatra avoided an even bigger catastrophe. If the earthquake had struck earlier in the day, many more people would have been at school or at work. Rebuilding after an earthquake is an opportunity to build better. But is it possible to build better at a reasonable cost? Yeah, I think it, it definitely is possible to build uh, earthquake resistant and earthquake safe structures economically. I think though it's going to require a lot of political will, building code provisions and some level of inspection from coming from a building department. But then I think it's really education through the whole design construction process. The Padang earthquake of September 2009 was very deep and it didn't relieve the stress on the main offshore fault. For this reason, we expect a large earthquake and tsunami to strike Padang sometime in the coming years. Preparedness is the key to avoiding a disaster. It's not easy to talk about um, disaster preparedness. People uh, forget easily, so this is a challenge, but we need to keep moving. We cannot stop.